Let us pray. Father, speak your word to our hearts, we pray. Glorify your name, for you are worthy. Your word is light, your word is life. Hide this ignoble lump of clay behind the cross and speak by your Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You know, there is a TV series that I love to watch. I don't know how many of you know it. It's, it's called Dirty Jobs. Dirty Jobs. Anybody here knows Dirty Jobs? Yeah, a couple of people know it. You know, hosted by Mike Rowe. Viewers are taken on a rendezvous into some of the most unthought about and unsanitary jobs. From escalator cleaners to cesspool engineers, from drain cleaners to horse manure specialists to vomitologists. You know what vomitologists are? You know what vomitologists are. <laughs> When he takes us through that rendezvous, he shows us how various unseen professions keep our world healthy and operable. But it was when I watched an episode on garbage collection that I had a renewed appreciation for those who handle our waste. Think about what would happen if the NSWMA workers went on strike for a month. Our nation would halt to a grind, a smelly, smelly grind. The series Dirty Jobs underscores the truth that every calling, every job, every profession is of great value to our existence. And there is an interdependence that must be fostered to ensure the equilibrium of life. So my desk job is not more important than your manual labor. My presence in a boardroom is not more valuable than your work in a trench. And today we begin Stewardship Month here at Webster. And as a nation, we focus on Customer Service Week. There is one man, one man from Scripture that I want us to focus on today. So Marcia didn't read in vain. I know some of you wondered where that reading came from and why that reading. Now, this man is easily overlooked because his name and his functions are captured in just one phrase. As a matter of fact, it is because of his job that we even know who he is. Turn your Bibles back to that text that was read, 1 Chronicles 27. And look at verse 28, the second part of 28. You will see there who I am talking about. I'm talking about Joash. The NIV says Joash was in charge of the supplies of oil. But if you look in the King James Version, it says, And over the sellers of oil, Joash. Now, if you come from country and you're as old as I am, you know what a seller is. A seller is like your butchery. A cellar is underneath the house, right? But let me put this whole thing into context for you. King David has built out his defense force for Judah. His top commanders are in place, and each of them has 24,000 men under their command. And he puts an administrative structure in place to facilitate the smooth running of the nation. Different tasks are assigned. The management of field servants, vineyards, and groves. The management of livestock and storehouses. Now, most of these assignments were prestigious in nature, not only because they were done in public view, but because the assignees were identified by the king. Now, my brothers and sisters... Just as David chose special groups of people to serve him, the Lord Jesus Christ has chosen special people, you and me, to serve his purposes. According to the Bible, God has given every single solitary believer a place of service in the kingdom of Christ. Once you are saved, you're enlisted for service. Could you tell somebody beside you? Once you are saved, 
you are enlisted for service. And that is why we assemble today in what is called a worship service. The idea is that as we lift songs of praise in worship to God and worship God through listening to his word, we leave to serve. So there is a connection between worship and service, hence worship service. Are we together so far? So in order for you and me to grow in Christ-likeness, you and I must serve in the work of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 tells us, For we are God's workmanship, or handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Could you tell the person beside you there's work to do? 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7 says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. As long as you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit lives in you and has the positive gifts in your life for use to benefit the body of Jesus Christ. So each of us has been saved to serve. A non-serving Christian is a contradiction in terms. Say that after me. A non-serving Christian is a contradiction in terms. All the people who serve have just said it. Thank God. So we should consider it a privilege, my friends, to have been chosen, to have been gifted, to have been called, to, be, to have been aligned to the church of Christ and the work of Almighty God. I want you to notice two things in David's system of operation. The first thing to notice is that each person had a place of special service. So listen, my friends. God chooses what we do, where we do it, and to what extent it is done. Each of us has been handpicked by God, equipped by God, positioned by God to do the work of God. No one else can do the job that you've been specifically designed and gifted to do but you. But there's another thing. Each person was called by name. So when you see the names in the Bible, don't think that they're there just to take up space. The names mean something. Listen, my friend, God knows each of us by name. And our name speaks not only to our identity or our destiny, but our name speaks to our God-given capacity. Every single one of these men who was named in David's setup, their names had a meaning linked to the person and the purpose of God. So now let us look at Joash. Because when I reflected on Joash, I wondered how he felt about himself. You see, friends, to the 21st century university graduate, there is nothing appealing about Joash. I mean, he could hardly be considered a role model for upward mobility. His resume is as limited as the contacts his job affords. And I'm sure that the place where he worked wasn't TikTok appropriate. You know, the other thing that strikes me about Josh is, I'm not sure how many young ladies would want to take him home to introduce to their parents. Abigail, where does your boyfriend Josh work? He works in a cellar, daddy. <laughs> Joab's job wasn't flashy. He served his king, but he did so in a dark, damp, and deserted cellar. He served his king, but he did so in isolation, away from glamour and away from the glory of the court. He served his king, but he did so in a place that was out of sight and out of mind. My sisters, my brothers, my friends, despite the seeming negatives of Josh's reality, there's a lot that we can learn from him regarding the hard posture that God requires of you and me. You see, Josh represents most of us in the church and even in the workplace. Some of us serve in obscurity. Nobody sees what we do or how much we contribute. 
And my friend, you may never be recognized at a long service award ceremony or invited to serve in an upfront role. But like hidden steel in a building, you silently hold the entire structure together. So there are one or two things I want to say about Josh, and I'll do so quickly. The first thing is this. Josh understood himself as an agent of grace. You see, he may have worked in obscurity, but that which he had to manage was of inestimable worth. His job was to keep the oil. His job was to manage the oil cellar. The olive oil was very important in the Jewish society. If you look at Leviticus chapter 2, you see where oil was used at the meat offering. In Leviticus chapter 7, oil was used in the trespass offering. If you look in Leviticus 14, Oil was used in the ceremonial cleansing of lepers. If you look in Exodus 29, oil was used in the anointing ritual for the priest. If you look at 1 Samuel 16 verse 13, oil was used to anoint king. Oil was used for lamp. Oil was used in both the house of God and the homes of ordinary people. Oil was used as a, an item of commerce in 1 Kings 5 verse 11. Oil was used as medicine in Luke 10 and James 5. Oil was used for cooking. Oil was used as a base for cosmetics. So what Joash had to give oversight to was a significant element of grace that impacted all of life, religious life and national life. And it was his responsibility to ensure that this crucial element, which signified the very presence of God, was intact. My sisters and my brothers, like Joash, each of us has been called to be a keeper of the oil. Ah, each of us is an agent of grace. The Holy Spirit lives in each of us and desires to use us for God's kingdom so that it can come and that God's will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when we meet to prepare the worship service and to rehearse, to lead God's people in worship, we are stewarding the oil. We are preparing the spiritual ground for people to encounter Jesus. A choir, you can't take your ministry lightly. Musicians, you cannot take your ministry lightly. When we sit around camera and computer and ensure that the world tunes into the worship of God, we are stewarding the oil. It means then that we must consistently sharpen our skills and give of our best because the souls of people are depending on us. Could you talk? somebody and tell them, steward the oil. <laughs> tell somebody, steward the oil. <laughs> when we package food items and lovely and lovingly ensure that the poor are served, we're operating as God's agents of grace. We're pointing people to Jesus in whom all needs are satisfied. Members of the church, ministry leaders, when we show up for ministry meetings and we foster a spirit of comradery so that the work can be lighter for all, we are stewarding the oil. My friends, whatever we do in the kingdom of God for the glory of God is a work of grace. When we create a safe space for our young people and our children and we show up for their concert this evening and nurture the things of God in them, we are keeping the oil. So I want to say to church school teachers and those who teach at the basic school and our youth coordinators, Keep on keeping watch over the aisle. Keep 
Watch over the souls of those in your care, your agents of grace. When we fold programs and warmly welcome our guests to our church, we are keeping the oil. When we visit the sick and coordinate district meetings, facilitating sessions of counseling and care, we are stewarding the oil. My friend, each of us is an agent of grace. It doesn't matter where you serve. What matters is how you serve and with what heart you serve. So singers must sing. And pastors must pass and elder must elder and deacon must deacon and preacher must preach. And we are recipients of the grace of God. And we have privilege to be channels of that grace. So let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun with diligence and discipline and humility as keepers of the oil. Joash, he understood that he was an agent of grace. And so must we. Are you getting this this morning? Does this make sense to you? I mean, you know, it's, it's good to be able to take a single phrase and build a sermon out of it by the grace of God. I mean, God's word has everything in it if we would just spend time, time in it. You know, the other thing about Joash is that Joash made himself available. You know, if there was one weapon that Satan uses effectively, it is the weapon of discouragement. Discouragement. Countless people have removed themselves from the rank of service because of discouragement. And you know, discouragement comes in many forms. Discouragement comes through people who are just so difficult to work with. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> now we're talking about the workplace, not church. I mean, <laughs> everybody at church is hunky dory and fine. Not. <laughs> you know, despite their gifts, they present more roadblocks to a process than anything else. And they have the emotional intelligence of a bulldog. The gifts of such persons would be better utilized under a seller. Now, I don't know if this was the reason why Joash worked in the cellar. But what I know is that his place of work posed a clear challenge. The first thing about his place of work is that it was an unnoticed place. It was a cellar. A place of limited interactions. Nobody ventures to a cellar of oil. It was a place without recognition or thanks. And I wonder to myself if, if Joash had ever heard of the accolades and the accomplishments and the advancements of other men in the king's service. I, I wonder if he felt left out. His place was an unnoticed place. His place was an uncomfortable place. It, it was a cellar. It was dark. It was dimly lit. It was dreary and dank and, and damp. But you know, despite his place of work, despite it being an unnoticed place and an uncomfortable place, Joash did his work for his king. He showed up and he did the work for the king. He wasn't doing it for the likes. He wasn't doing it for the recognition. He had he. He did just for his king. He dutifully and he diligently made himself available to do what his king required. You know what Joash's name means? Joash's name means Jehovah fired. Ah, there was a fire burning in him. Just as, could you touch somebody and ask them, is the fire of the Holy Spirit in you burning to serve? My, my sisters and my brothers, when we have, if they didn't answer, if they never answer, yes, you know, that judgment. That. <laughs> right, right, right. When we have the heart to serve, human applause isn't our primary focus. Because you see, 
if our service is fueled by human applause, what will happen when it dies down? To become subject to the applause and adoration of people is a dangerous thing because it stokes the fires of pride, self-sufficiency, and self-aggrandizement. But a heart that seeks to serve seeks only the applause of one almighty God himself. The heart says, I will do my best and I will give my best. As long as my king is satisfied, then I am okay. So think about it, my friend. Have you really been giving your best to God? Think about it, honestly. Have you really been giving your best to God? Have you been serving with the best of intentions and the best of effort? You see, as stewards of the oil, we really should take Colossians 3 verse 17 seriously. And whatever you do, whatever it is, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Joash was available to do the king's bidding. He wasn't missing when work needed to be done. He didn't give shoddy workmanship. And to have been given this stewardship responsibility of something so significant meant that the king saw in him an excellent spirit. Do you have an excellent spirit, my sister, my brother? Do you really have an excellent spirit? Do you yearn for excellence? No, I'm not talking about perfection, but I'm talking about excellence. Being your best and giving your best. God requires excellence from each of us. And you know the curse of our age is mediocrity. Where we do anything and give any old thing any old way. I go to the um, gas station the other day. Go buy a gas. And the girl. Oi, oi, you sir, move your car, move your car, move your car. Don't move. So. I'm sitting there, and, and I, I'm not moving a car because I don't think it's me she's talking to. To be honest, I wasn't being facetious. I just, <laughs> then she come knock on the window. Move your car, move your car. So I said, lady, wait, wait, because there are some things that you have to understand. One, nobody shouts at me. I'm married to a woman whose voice is soft. And all she has to do is look. <laughs> and she said, me can't bother And you know, I kissed my teeth. And I was going to drive off. But remember that the car on E. So. <laughs> but, but the understanding is that not because I'm dependent on your service. You behave in any, any old way. Come on, don't, don't behave as if I am begging you to spend my money with you. There are many other options. And as Jamaicans, we really need to buy into this customer service excellence. <laughs> service requires excellence, my friends. It requires our best. For only our best is good enough. And Josh clearly understood what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Josh teaches us, my friends, that availability must manifest itself in faithfulness. So if you have something to do, do it to the best of your ability. Give the area of service to which you're called your best effort and keep giving and serving in that area until the Lord releases you to go elsewhere. I close because we have to go to the sacrament of Holy Communion. Joash, he understood that he was an agent of grace. Joash, 
he was accountable. Joash. What was the second point? He's not accountable. He was, ah, you were listening. All right, available. Well, the final point is that he was accountable. I gave it away a while ago. He understood who called him. He understood that he didn't call himself. He understood that he had to give a report to the king. And the thing I think about Joash is that he made sure that he consistently checked the cellar, consistently checked the barrels, consistently checked the oil, for he did not necessarily know when the king would come and ask for an accounting of the oil. He didn't just operate in a way where at the last minute he pushed something together and sell the king a story. He was proactive. He was diligent. He was dutiful. He was disciplined. This is what accountability is all about. My friends, we do not know when Jesus will return. We do not know when the trumpet will sound. We do not know when we will die and stand before God to give an account for everything we have done in this life as it regards the stewardship of our time, our talents, our treasure. And since we do not know, we need to be aware that each of us is accountable. Joash was accountable. And because he knew that day was coming, he gave of himself fully to his task. And I believe that each time David called him before him, David could smile. For there was a man standing before him who despite working in the underground outside of human applause, did his work diligently and creatively. And I believe that David must have had a smile on his face. It makes me think about the King of Kings, that on that day when we all stand before him to give account, it is my prayer but when I stand before him, he will have a smile on his face. And I pray that I will hear from his lips, well done, good and faithful servant. Check your heart, my friend. Check your heart. Check your heart.